This week, we continue our discussion of the ultimate nature of reality by considering the problem of transcendence and immanence. Is God radically distinct from, present in, or actually identical with the world? This problem exists in essentially all traditions which have a concept of God. Thus, Judaism, which tends to emphasize transcendence, nonetheless has teachings about the Shekinah, or divine presence, usually referred to in the feminine, and an entire system of sephirot, or emanations from the divine. Christianity speaks of God becoming incarnate and of the indwelling spirit, which in turn required it to develop the concept of the Trinity. But nowhere is the question of transcendence and immanence more central to theological debate than in the Hindu darshana or philosophical school known as Vedanta. For Vedanta, the fundamental philosophical problem is the relationship between Brahman and Atman. Brahman is the creative principle behind the universe. Atman is self, our individual identity. There are pr three principal schools of Vedanta, Advaita, Vishishta Advaita, and Vaita, or non-dualism, modified non-dualism, and dualism, associated with the teachers Shankara, Ramanuja, and Madhva, respectively. Many scholars believe that Vedanta developed as a response to Buddhism, which taught that nothing has inherent existence. This led philosophically to difficulties explaining why there is something rather than nothing, and tended to promote an intense otherworldliness and an exclusive focus on seeking enlightenment. While Hinduism values enlightenment above all, it also recognizes other legitimate aims in life, such as lawful pleasure, the pursuit of wealth and power necessary to live a good life, and the struggle for social justice. Vedanta accommodated a way of life which valued and even prioritized the pursuit of enlightenment within the Hindu context without the socially destabilizing dynamic which many saw in Buddhism. Non-dualism, or the Advaita school, best represented by Shankara, teaches that Brahman and Atman are identical and that our separate existence is, in effect, an illusion. The argument behind Advaita Vedanta is ultimately very straightforward. What makes something real is its causative power, the power of being. But the things we encounter in the phenomenal world lack the power of being in and of themselves. As the Buddhists point out, they are dependent for their existence on other things and are thus not really real. Unlike the Buddhists, however, the Advaita teach that there must be something which has the power of being in itself. Otherwise, there would not be anything at all. That is Brahman. Nothing else is really real, and our Atman and that of others is in fact the same and identical with this causative power. We achieve liberation and enlightenment when we recognize this not just conceptually, but non-conceptually and experientially. The Advaita school thus values yoga, meditation, and tantra, often pursued in a monastic setting. While there are Advaita who recognize Vishnu as the supreme deity, most favor Shiva, or various forms of Shaktism, which understands the supreme deity as feminine. In other contexts, this approach to understanding the relationship between God and the world is often called pantheism though the term often results in misunderstanding, since there are, in fact, very few philosophers or theologians who simply identify God and the world in a simple and literal sense. In general, as with Advaita, it is more nearly a question of rejecting the independent reality of the world, considered apart from God, in whose being it shares. The intellectual difficulty with non-dualism is, of course, that we actually experience separate things in the world which seem to be independent of each other, and indeed, the world itself seems to be independent of our experience. Practically, the non-dualist approach to enlightenment requires either a very high level of intellectual formation and spiritual discipline, or tantric practices which, like Buddhism, are often seen as socially destabilizing. The Shishtadvaita, or modified non-dualism, attempts to solve these problems. The most important philosopher in the school is Ramanuja, who taught that individual souls and other things in the world are really separate from Brahman, but they do share in Brahman's creative power and can ultimately achieve union with Brahman. While some Advaita, or non-dualists, recognize bhakti or devotion to a personal god as a first step towards enlightenment, Ramanuja made bhakti the central part of his soteriology, with a focus on devotion to Vishnu as the supreme deity. Modified non-dualism is an example of panentheism, or the idea that God is distinct from but present in the world, a position which is common especially in Catholic Christianity and some forms of Judaism and Islam. Madhvacharya, the founder of the Vaita, or dualistic Vedanta, 
went further and argued that there are real and insuperable distinctions between God, souls, and material things which cannot be overcome so that we never achieve full union with Brahman. He shared Ramanuja's emphasis on bhakti or devotion as a means of salvation, but argued that there are different degrees of bliss among the saved and that some souls are never liberated from rebirth and that indeed some are eternally damned to hell. This is similar to the transcendental theism upheld by most Protestant and some Catholic Christianity, as well as much, but not all, Islam. Where do you stand? What is the relationship between God and the world? And how does it affect the way in which you live?